Hello again. Um, I, again, I apologize for my lack of, of uh, technical skills when it comes to uh, posting video blogs. Uh, you'll have to uh, show me a lot of uh, leeway here. Um, again, I'm doing this not so much because I'm a professional blog, video blogger, but more because I'm just concerned that people are going to get themselves in a lot of trouble um, because they really don't know how it is that they, by their own choices, have bound themselves up in a type of Gordian knot that, um, with the government. Uh, this is the third video, kind of in a series. Um, if you haven't seen the first two, you want to go back and check those out. The first one's on Parents Patre and How You Made the State Your Daddy. And uh, the uh, second video is the... Uh, uh, we left off with here. We got kind of cut off because I'm not very good at what I'm doing. <laughs> so uh, please excuse me on that. But in the last uh, video, we ended off with this. I'm, I'm, we're talking about property and different titles and how uh, people are really anymore. They just have a legal title to possess and use, but they have to pay a tribute to a superior to the superior owner. Um, in the form of taxes, licenses, registration fees, things like that. And if they don't, uh, then uh, they'll have that property taken from them or they'll be arrested and have a fine or something like that. So remember, we kind of left off with uh, this quote from back in April of 1933 uh, during the Great Depression when um, the United States went off the gold standard domestically and basically hypothecated that gold as collateral on the debt because it was owed to the Federal Reserve. And we talked a little bit about that in the last video. <clears throat> so we were um, kind of, uh, we left off right here with Elodial. And that was the kind of title that Americans had a long time ago when they were actually paying debts at law instead of discharging them in the commercial um, stream of commerce. Uh, under the Uniform Commercial Code and Maritime Law and Equity and that sort of thing. And where we left off, I thought uh, we didn't we didn't uh, get this last definition in here in the previous video. And this one's kind of interesting because um, it's homo liber, which it means homo obviously is man, and then liber is free. Uh, that's where you get like liberty. So it's a free man. Homo liber is a free man. But what does that mean? Now look at this an allodial proprietor as distinguished from a vassal or feudatory. Now, are you an allodial proprietor? Or do you have to pay, uh, like on your house, do you pay a property tax every year? On your car, do you have to register that property and get the update the license plates and, and maintain your driver's license? So, you, you know, any of that is evidence, excuse me, any of that is evidence <clears throat> that you have this mere uh, legal title to possess and use, where the state, as your daddy, is the superior owner and the central bank has a uh, superior interest as well. So again, you have the legal title, but not the equitable title. And remember, legal title is the antithesis of equitable title. And the allodial title is really the combination of the legal title, which is the use and possession, and the equitable title, which is the beneficial interest um, and uh, the control, the real control over the title. So uh, remember, allodial is free, not holding of any lord or superior, like the state or central bank. Owned without an obligation of vassalage or fealty excise taxes, registration, licenses, the opposite of feudal. So Americans are no longer truly free men. They're, bond, they're voluntary bond servants under commercial law, and that's why they're regulated and controlled by the state to the nth degree. And we'll get more into that. But you saw in Parents Patre that the state is actually your parent. So that's uh, so a lodial proprietor as distinguished from a vassal or feudatory a free man lawfully competent to act as a common law juror. 
Um, now that's an interesting little phrase there. That's what that's talking about is the power of jury nullification to not only be able to judge the facts, but to judge the law itself. And this is why America was such a free country, because any laws that the that the state representatives or the federal congressmen made that the executive signed into civil law, uh, the American people were actually the last bastions of that constitutional besides the courts, uh, we could nullify bad law because we were a low deal proprietor. We were the bosses. Well, now we're not the bosses. We're the human resources. So now we just get to judge the facts and the judges judge the law. And that's why we have to look now to like the courts to tell us what is lawful um, based on the legislative actions of the Congress. It's a, it's a really, um, you know, horrible situation. And the people are just not very uh, attuned as to what's going on um, and how this works. So let's continue on here. I've got a few more things to show you uh, today. Um, let's go back to quotes on banking real quick. Just so you remember, the entire taxing and monetary systems are hereby placed under the Uniform Commercial Code. Uh, that's in the Federal Tax Lien Act of 1966. And from Stanick versus White, uh, there is a distinction between a debt discharged using funny money, paper, credit, uh, checks, um, crypto, bills, notes, all that sort of thing, versus debt paid with substance. These are two, two different forms of law. This will always be in that commercial civil law. This will always be in natural common law. Um, and we see that uh, every circulating Federal Reserve note, FRN, is a dollar worth of debt to the Federal Reserve. And a dollar was originally a, a certain amount of weight of silver. Um, so just remember all of those things as we proceed on, because we've got, I thought we'd, we'd look at this tribute and excise. And I've got some dictionaries here set up for us to kind of go through. Let's see where it's okay. I got two here. Let's get this first one. This will probably be excise. Remember the property taxes you pay, um, the uh, pretty much all the taxes you pay are an excise, which uh, which was what we used to call tribute. So excise, an internal tax levied on the production, sale, or consumption of certain commodities such as tobacco or liquor within a country. Two. This is the important one. A tax often levied in the form of a licensing charge or a fee for certain privileges. Remember, if you don't own that property, if you don't own it in a lodium, you need to get permission, a license, from the real owner to be able to keep your possession in use. So all of these taxes and fees that you're paying to use a car, to use, you know, to, to stay in your house, those are fees that you're paying a tribute, an excise to the state who's your daddy under parents' patre. Okay, let's see. I think probably these this one's going to take us back to tribute when I get to this second tab here that I put in here to find it easier. Oops. Excuse me. Don't, don't get sick to your stomach. <laughs> tribute. And you can see a tribute is a gift, payment, declaration, or other acknowledgement of gratitude, respect, or admiration. And that's kind of the basic generalization here. We have a daddy who's letting us use stuff, and um, we're grat grateful and respectful and admire that state for letting us have that. So number two, we see a sum of money or other valuables paid by one ruler or nation to another as acknowledgement of submission or as the price for protection by that nation. And there's some elements of that that we have too. Um, because citizenship is a, um, as a member in a corporate body politic, um, carries with it submission or, you know, to uh, an obeying of the laws. So then now we're going to start getting into it. A payment made for protection. A payment or tax given by a feudal vassal to his overlord. Bingo. 
the obligation involved in such a payment. So tribute and excise are pretty much the same thing. Let me get this one out of the way. We'll see Black's Law Dictionary is pretty much going to give us the same kind of situation here. We'll start again with excise. Get focused. A tax imposed on the performance of an act, the engaging in an occupation, or the enjoyment of a privilege. Nailed it. And then we see again, tax laid on the manufacture, sale, or consumption of commodities, or upon licenses to pursue certain occupations, or upon corporate privileges. In current usage, the term has been extended to include various licensing fees and practically every internal revenue tax except the income tax. Now, the income tax is still an excise tax. We just don't call it excise. Um, we divide it out and call it income. But it's still an excise. It's still a tribute for a privilege. You have no right to labor within the stream of commerce. That is a regulated privilege. Okay, so now tribute and tributary, I thought we'd do both. And, oops, sorry about that. Tributary, <clears throat> and there's two times, types of, you know, tributary also you see above there uh, like a river. Um, but we're talking about the, the individual who's paying tribute. Paying or yielding tribute taxed or assessed by tribute. And then tribute. A contribution which is raised by a prince or sovereign from his subjects to sustain the expenses of the state. A sum of money paid by an inferior sovereign or state to a superior potentate to secure the friendship or protection of the latter. Acknowledgement of gratitude or respect. So we can see that um, these are the kind of things that we bound ourselves back into as kind of a neo feudal serfdom um, bondage of Egypt this is a friend of mine wrote this book it's very good um, you can get it um, online the covenant of the gods his name is uh, Greg Williams I've got a couple of things in here in this book that kind of cover this too that I thought we'd we'd look at um, he's got some quotes here from different sources uh, this first one says excise tribute in its origin is the patrimonial right of emperors and kings now that's footnote 287 so let's drop down here to footnote 287 it says oh this is just reciting a latin maxim of law a uh, vectigal origina ipsa jus cesarium et regum patrimoniale est so excise i tribute in its origin is the patrimonial right of emperors and kings remember what is patre father Parents patre is the state of the, of the uh, parent is um, the state. And let's see here. A person shall not be allowed to enrich himself unjustly. Now, that's a deeper topic here, but that's what happens when you use a Federal Reserve note to get something of substance. You're enriching yourself unjustly. And a constructive trust is immediately raised in law to divide those titles at <clears throat> the expense of another. <clears throat> then it should also be true that any bounties, donations, or benefits that are not owed but accepted ooh, will create an obligation to the benefactor on the part of the recipient. Hey, have you received some bailouts recently for COVID? Did you reject them because you want to maintain your freedom? Or did you accept them and now you are now obligated because you accepted it? This is how they do this. This is consent. Like Jefferson wrote, all governments get their power from the consent of the governed. So government, like any, any con man, <laughs> and that's a little harsh, they make you offers. They're just reacting to your policies of what you're what you're crying out for. So they extend you an offer. Say everybody's screaming, oh, we want health care. We want health care. We want health care. We want retirement pensions. We want retirement pensions. 
So <clears throat> when, the, when the citizenry, the subjects start crying out to the Lord and Master, the sovereign power, the God, their father, the state, well, he's going to respond with an offer. Oh, okay, you want me to take care of you when you're old? Okay, let's do a Ponzi uh, tontine wagering scheme in the form of Social Security. And then, you know, and that becomes your taxpayer ID and employee ID, and you can use it to work in the stream of commerce as a license. Oh, sweet. Okay, well, you accepted the benefit. Now you got to deal with the obligations. What's the obligations? Well, you got to pay taxes. So just always remember, protection draws to it subjection. Subjection, protection. Right, I think I marked one other page here. Maybe not. Maybe I didn't. thought I did. Maybe it fell out. I think it's on page 100. Let me get to hand just a few more. Oh, yep, it slipped. Oh, look at that. I think I moved it so I could read, but I forgot that I wouldn't be able to see it. <laughs> All right, let's see what we have here. The right and authority to impose an excise tax tribute on land or labor, <coughs> oops, land or labor, is based on the inadequacies of a legal title having been equitably converted just as in the days of Pharaoh. Hmm. This is equitable conversion. You know, you did own your labor under the common and natural law, but you equitably converted your labor to go be employed in an occupation for an artificial person in the stream of commerce with a taxpayer identification number called a social security number or a, TI, a taxpayer ID number, TIN, EIN. And in that equitable conversion to do something that you didn't have a right to do, now it's become a regulated privilege under a license permit, so to speak. That's why you get business licenses, occupational licenses. You know, your, your SSN basically is an employee license. Um, and then you have to pay a tax. You got to pay the tribute to the master that provides the benefit, the stream of commerce, the commercial economy. And that's regulated and controlled by the state and the United States. And through covetousness. Now, this is from the Bible. This is a quote out of what we got here. Second Peter. Yeah, Second Peter 2, 3. This is pretty good. If we'd only read this stuff and understand what it's talking about. And through covetousness. That's what we're doing. We're coveting stuff within the stream of commerce. Man, I want to be like Bill Gates. I want to be like Warren Buffett. I want to have all kinds of stuff. You know, I can't do that with substance. So I got to equitably convert stuff so I can get everything through the custom and tradition of all this stuff. Okay, so through covetousness shall they with feigned words. <clears throat> Here comes the, the contra, you know, the offer from the con man, the state. Through feigned words make merchandise of you. Human resource in the stream of commerce. Biblically, it's called Canaanite trafficking. Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. So basically, look, you're going to bitch, moan, and complain to death and not understand this, but you did it to yourselves. It should be clear that even though you may discharge the debt of, a, of mortgages and obtain legal titles, you still do not have clear and good titles, which are synonymous. Clear title meaning that the land is free from encumbrances. Good title being one free from litigation, palpable defects, and grave doubts comprising both legal and equitable titles and fairly deducible of record. So again, a lodial title is basically the combination of the legal title, legal title, and that equitable title. But when you use a Federal Reserve note or you know any kind of commercial paper, negotiable instrument in, the, in commercial law, that raises a constructive trust. 
and then the titles are split. The state, as your father gets, uh, the, really holds it, but the central bank has a huge interest in it because they're the, the ones that are issuing the funny money for you to use in the stream of commerce uh, to discharge debts. So there's uh, some other quotes from other sources to give you some ideas that, um, you know, I'm not just making stuff up here. Let me get my computer back up. Now let's go look at, uh, i got a couple other ones here I'll just show you real quick. Let's start with, from, uh, this is from, <clears throat> uh, I got this out of Diefendorf versus Galay. Diefendorf versus Galay is an income tax case out of Idaho, comes out of the Idaho Supreme Court. And when it comes to income, the courts are going to use language that can be a little confusing because they really... They don't want you to fully understand this. Um, they do, but they don't. But Diefendorf Galay, whoever, whatever judge up in Idaho wrote this, they're, they're, uh, they're giving you the straight skinny here. So it says, income is necessarily the product of the joint efforts of the state and the recipient of the income. The state furnishing the protection, protection draws to its subjection, necessary to enable the recipient to produce, receive, and enjoy it, and a tax thereon in the, the last analysis is simply a portion cut from the income and appropriated by the state as its share thereof. Bingo. No right to operate in the stream of commerce. That is a privilege that is regulated, taxed, and licensed. You want to uh, control your labor, you got to do it within the natural and common law in a private transaction using substance, not affecting a public interest. And maybe we'll pull that case up here too. I've got one that'll kind of clarify that. Let me see what else we got here. I think I got another one from Diefendorf. Yeah, this is good too. This is again from Diefendorf versus Galay out of Idaho. Same case, but somewhere else in that case, another quote from it excises, <clears throat> those excise taxes, tributes, in their original sense, were something cut off from the price paid on the sale of goods as a contribution to support of government. The word has, however, come to have a broader meaning and includes every form of taxation which is not a burden laid directly upon persons or property. That's important. In other words, excise includes every form of charge imposed by public authority for the purpose of raving re revenue upon the performance of an act, the enjoyment of a privilege, or the engaging in an occupation. You see that tax? This is going to be hard for you to, to, to comprehend right now because you're so deep into this and don't fully understand it. Property in the United States has never been taxed or assessed. Did you get that? Property has never been taxed or assessed. What has been taxed or assessed is the value of most taxes. And, and, and remember, that's for engaging in an occupation, perf uh, performing a regulatable act under the civil commercial law, or the enjoyment of a privilege. And, and those taxes are due for the tribute of doing those things within a this other jurisdiction of law. And the Constitution allows this. This is not unconstitutional, kids. The Constitution allows this. This is what freedom is all about. You have to understand these two different forms of law so that you can make the choices you need to make in order to be free or be happy being a bond servant. It's up to you. It really is. And you can change and repent. I don't know exactly how most people would do that because they're and then we'll do a couple more here. Let's see, I can't remember. Oh yeah, this is a, is that the one I want? Yeah, we'll do that one last here. Let's go to Doyle versus Mitchell Brothers. This is a good one too. This is a US Supreme Court case. Of course, a little older. So they're, they're kind of telling you the truth here, 1918. The act employs the term income. And in its natural and obvious sense, as importing something distinct from principal or capital, i.e. property, and conveying the idea of gain 
or increase arising from corporate activities. All corporate activities are done within that commercial law. So now while you may not be a corporation, you may be employed by a corporation or LLC or sole proprietorship, some sort of commercially licensed business, public business entity engaging in public commerce, affecting a public interest. And therefore, all you're doing as your wages, salaries, and tips is you're getting your fair share, comrade, of the corporate profit the increase, the profit or gain from corporate activities. Oh, that's my Belgian Malinois. She's not somebody's. So that's what income is. Income is not property. Income is derived from property. And when you're employed, you're getting income because you're being you're you're deriving that income as a share of the corporate profit or gain. And because of that, you owe a tribute to your master who regulates and controls the stream of commerce and protects everybody's interest in there from 14th Amendment artificial U.S. persons like State Farm and Texaco and Twitter and Facebook and everybody else, General Electric and Lockheed Martin and U.S. 14th Amendment natural persons. Joe Smith. Did you understand that? That means Joe Smith, natural person, has the same civil rights under the 14th Amendment as General Electric, U.S. artificial person. And because of that, General Electric can outlive you. They have a lot more power and they take on a lot more responsibility. That's like insurance. Who's responsible in an insurance policy contract? The guy that pays the deductible and the premium? And limits his liability to just that expense, and does it if he does a hundred thousand dollars worth of damage. Well, I'm on the hook for a thousand dollar my annual premium or deductible and uh, two thousand dollar annual premiums, so I'm out three th three thousand dollars. But State Farm's got to cover the other ninety seven thousand. Well, now you know why State Farm, artificial U.S. person with rights, goes into the legislature and lobbies the legislature and says, "Hey, all these Joe Schmoes out here with limiting liability." Well, we need to pass seatbelt laws and seat and and speed limit laws and all these other things because they're they're fools out here driving like crazy. And it's a more powerful person because it's bearing the burden of the financial expense to to while you're limiting your liability. So that's just a little more of the story for you. And here's a good one too. This is from Penn Mutual Indemnity Company versus Commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, deductions from tax are a matter of legislative grace. This is your God giving you sovereign power, your lawmaker and ruling judge. Legislative grace. And if the grace is not sufficient to leave something over for the taxpayer, he has no legal grounds for complaint, whatever the hardship may be. The mere fact of intake being less than outgo does not relieve the taxpayer of an other, otherwise lawfully imposed tax. Ouch. Because again, you're dealing with privileges and regulations, not rights and property. If you want to express your rights, you must have property and always remember Rights follow responsibilities, duties, and obligations, not the other way around. When you surrender these very important duties and obligations and where there's risk on you, where you're strictly liable, now you can exercise some rights. But if you want your employer to protect you, give you an occupation, and pay you out of the profit and gain from that corporation, provide you health care, and you're going to get insurance for all kinds of purposes to limit your liability, but you get some benefits, you're a ward. These are all guardian-ward relationships, just like the one you have with the state under parents patre, where the state is your father. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how responsible you think you are. You're a ward of the state. You are a legal incompetent. 
and you must be cared for. Now, you could grow up at any time, but you don't know how. It's been many, many decades and three or four or five generations of Americans that have been ensnared in this little game of neo-feudal serfdom under the 14th Amendment and the commercial law. So we'll continue with this series as best I can to help you out. But uh, I think for now, we'll just leave it there. I appreciate you watching. Thanks for being patient with my uh, inexperience of, of uh, technology. And I hope you keep coming back. Thanks. Bye.